Hey guys, uh, it's been a long time since I've put together a video uh, for Wounded for War, uh, but there's a new season that's been stirring in my heart. Uh, there's been this element of, of seeing a lot of people struggle in life right now. Um, tons of different people going through uh, a lot of suffering, tons of people going through struggle, and, and it's hard to n just sit back and watch it and not do anything about it. And so I thought, gosh, um, what better thing to do than to do a series on uh, specifically um, being not just in life and surviving, but thriving in life. Even though you will experience hardship, battle, um, suffering, whatever you want to call it, uh, the good, bad, and the ugly of life. Uh, I want to uh, just encourage people in this season, as you may know, um, I put this channel together because of all the suffering that I've been through in life. And I wanted to encourage others. And so I just really feel like it's that season to bring it back to life. So uh, the four series, uh, four, four week series that I'm going to put together is um, essentially talking about that thriving, um, how do you how do you survive in this uh, culture and, and thrive? And so the very first week, we're going to talk about um, being in Christ. And maybe you, you've heard that term before, being in Christ. Um, some people believe that it's just, it happens at a moment when you um, decide that you want to follow Jesus, and, and so you give your life to him, and therefore you're in Christ. You're now in the family. Um, a lot of people believe also that it's something that's based on your behavior, that that it's not uh, once you're in, uh, it's done, but instead it's something that based on your behavior, do's and don'ts, list of, of good and bad, that how you follow is going to determine where you end up, whether you're in Christ or whether you're in hell, essentially, right? Um, and there's valid scriptures for those uh, those areas of belief. I mean, um, in Hebrews 3, 6, and um, it, it talks about um, where you find people that need to keep courage or hold on to the faith or be confident in the hope that we have in Christ, right? Leading us to believe, hey, you can walk away. And he's talking to brothers and sisters in Christ at the moment, right? Um, there's also, uh, and we should take a look at this one, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 1. For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. We're going to talk about that word in just a minute. But as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready. So he's he's talking to these people and he's saying, hey, your spiritual people, um, he's talking to the Corinthians, which was a church that struggled with a lot of various sins, which just means missing the mark. Essentially, they're missing the mark of what it means to be um, in Jesus, in Christ, following him, in relationship with God. And so he's, he's talking to these guys, and, and he does address them as brothers and sisters. So they're family. There's a, a, a nuance there of, hey, you're family. You're specifically uh, a fellow believer in Christ, and, and you are, are loved by Christ. And he's talking to them, but he's also saying, hey, though you're in Christ, uh, you're walking and living life as, um, as people of the flesh. And, and so people of the flesh, what does that mean, essentially? He's talking about individuals that are walking in, in a, a pattern and in a way that reflects the way of this world, that reflects the way of our, our desires, not God's desires. He's talking about people that essentially walk in this old nature that we have as we're born into a world that is destructive chaos. And uh, yeah, there's some pleasure to, to be had in this world, uh, no doubt, but they're constantly being um, uh, just infiltrated by, by sorrows and pains and suffering, right? Uh, we're not gonna leave this life without those things. And so these people are living in a manner 
that is not pleasing to God. They're, they're living out the passions and pleasures of their own desires. He refers to them, though, as family and as loved individuals. Um, and at the end of it, at, at that chapter, he talks in verse 16 and 17 about how um, that in, in this, if, they, if anyone destroys God's temple, he's, they say, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. So he's like, hey, you are brothers and sisters. You are, and, and the word in there is Adolfos. It's literally like in Christ, um, Christian believer. And he's saying, hey, but, but if you choose to walk away and continue to walk in this path of, of uh, the old life, old nature, um, you're going to end up... Uh, being destroyed because you're choosing to destroy your body, the temple in which God built it. Um, I don't know about you, but at this point, sounds like horrible news. Sounds like a lot of work. Um, sounds like a struggle. And don't forget, I told you that I, I did this channel to encourage people in times of suffering, struggling, and, and going through hardships, right? So isn't this horrible news for those that are, you know, suffering or, or going through hard times or, or maybe, you know, you have mental illness. Uh, I personally have some uh, issues in that area uh, and my family does as well. And um, we, we obviously we, we uh, look at that and, and we're, we're like, man, is there more work to do when I come to Christ? Is there, is there, there, there's like, I, I'm coming to God in this moment where I'm struggling, I'm having my worst forget day, uh, my, my worst decade, right? And now I come to Christ and he says, you're going to have to hold on. You're going to have to struggle to maintain. You're going to have to fight to, to hold on to me or you could lose me and then you're screwed. That does not sound like good news. You know, anyone that has been through a lot, and I mean a lot, knows that the last thing you want to hear is, as an encouragement, is just hold on a little bit longer or keep going. You can do this. It's kind of a slap in the face to those that have been through it so much that they want to give up. I mean, mental illness alone with bipolar or things of that nature, you have a proclivity towards suicide in those moments. So it's not good news to keep pressing on. But what does the, the Bible talk about when it says good news? It's it, The word uh, gospel means good news. So, so where is that good news? Let's spend the rest of our time talking about uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15 through 17. And... Uh, Let's read it real quick. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in case you're following along, uh, verse 15 through 17, and I'll read it. It says, and he died for all. All. Not some. All. Crazy, huh? So that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. From now on, then... We do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there's our phrase. He is a new creation. The old has passed away. And see, the new has come. So let's unpack this a little bit. Uh, it says, you know, what did Jesus do for us? In the very beginning, it says that, that essentially he died for all. For, for what reason? All of us miss the mark. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what Romans says. And so we may not like that that says that, but the truth is I know that I'm never hitting 100%. I'm not 100 all the time. 
therefore I've missed the mark of someone. Guaranteed if you ask my wife, I've missed the mark. Guaranteed if you ask my kids, they're going to tell you I'm not batting 100, 100% 100 of the time. So he died for all. He died for all of us because we're sinners, because we did not meet the requirement meant for heaven, and that is perfect righteousness. Now, he lived that life, and then he died and accounted that righteousness to me, to you, to anyone who would receive that gift that he's giving. Now, he died for us all. This is clearly stated also in John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He says that he was the propitiation. Essentially, that's the satisfied payment for our sins and not just for ours, but for the sins of what? The whole world, it says. So, why? So that we may live no longer these lives for ourselves, but for him who died, rose again on what? On our behalf. So he made a way for me to have, for you to have new life. Now comes the therefore. It's kind of interesting because this section of scripture in verse uh, 15 starts with what he did, but then he gives 16 and 17, the very first words he gives is therefore, which means Whatever he says in 15, in 16 and 17, we can do in light of 15. So he says, he made a way for new life, therefore. So don't look at others in light of their old ways of life or current ways that we call sin. Because they've been paid for. We don't look at the people in light of that. Paul says that... Um, we knew Jesus as a man, right? He knew Jesus as a man. He knew him in the flesh, but no longer in that way is how he views him. Why? Paul knew that Jesus leaving his flesh, his, his body meant that not his sin, flesh doesn't mean sin in this case. It meant his actual body. But it meant that if he left his body, when he was raised from the dead, that he would actually now, that we would know him in a much better way. How would we know him in a much better way? If having the very person of God here, uh, Paul looking at the life of Jesus saying, man, it's better that he actually goes away. It's better that he's not here. Even though we knew him by who he was here, why would he say such a thing? He would say it because, you know, here, while Jesus was here on earth, how was he known? He was known as a good teacher. People called him a prophet. Um, some even called him Lord, right? Peter and, and some of these disciples said, hey, um, you're Lord, right? And so people knew him by a role or something that he... Um, maybe was known from one town to the next, right? <clears throat> but they knew what he was capable of while he was here. He could be a leader. He could be a guide. Um, but he wasn't, and don't take this wrong, but he wasn't much help to every individual because he could only be at one place at one time. However, Paul knows something different. Paul says, hey, uh, it's better because that we know him not in the flesh the way we knew him, but in a different way. You see, a moment shifted in time when, when, when Jesus was raised from the dead. When Jesus left this earth, he also gave us a promise. He gave us a promise that he would send another. And, and literally, when he says that, it says another of the same likeness. Only there's a difference in one sense, and that's that um, Jesus had power to raise the dead. Jesus had power to heal 
the blind and the, the lame. Jesus had power to take those that were suffering from mental illness and heal them, uh, whether it was demonic or otherwise. And, and that would be wonderful for you or me if he was in our room in the moment that we're struggling. But you see, what happens when Jesus isn't here and I need someone? What happens when you or I are struggling at work or whether I'm struggling uh, in my marriage or maybe I'm struggling with my kids or my boss, whatever the case may be, my car breaks down, my finances are gone. There, there's many things or the illness comes, the diagnosis of, of uh, mental illness, whatever it may be that strikes you in a moment at a place you need a power and a person that you can turn to. I was sharing this with a, another friend of mine that essentially if you, if you are just coming to someone and sharing your griefs and like, man, life sucks and, and I'm getting hit hard and, and my car broke down and my, you know, this happened. And, you know, we recently had a transmission uh, break on my truck. And if I didn't know the right person and place to go, I, I just have a broken truck. He has to be the right person and the right skills, has to have the right tools, has to know where to find the parts. All these things are important or else we don't move with that truck anymore. That truck is, is waste. It's garbage. It's trash. And you see what Jesus did was he provided that person and in every place that we go. Even though we have known Jesus according to the flesh, it said, yet we know him in this way no longer. What's Paul saying there? You see, the promise of the Holy Spirit met the people of God and the followers of Jesus in a way that impacts us today, even 2,000 years later. You see, he sent his spirit to go out where he couldn't be. He was one man on the earth. Now, he has sent his Holy Spirit out into the world to be in and with us. And what does that mean? You know, the name of the Holy Spirit in the Bible is Paracletus. Paracletus actually means to um, one who is called to one's side, especially to help. Also means intercessor, uh, one who pleads the cause of another before a judge. He's also called the comforter, the counselor, the strengthener. And the best part of it all is that he's literally Jesus now living in us. We have that power, that strength, that person that we need to cry out to that has the ability to help us in our time of need, our time of struggle, our time of, of going through it. Paul realizes that we now have help to live this new life that we are called to. I want to I want to read you uh, Romans chapter eight. If you have a Bible, follow with me there. Romans chapter eight, and go to verse eleven. It says here, and the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. You know, it's literally the dying of Christ and raising him from the dead that made all the difference in the world because it was the power that was displayed in that moment of him raising from the dead and pouring out his spirit that made him completely different. Not a good teacher, not a prophet, just not a, a person who could lead individuals or a new movement or something of that nature, but instead the individual you and I would need in the time of struggle in life. 
he would send another, a helper. You know, you and I have that invitation to receive Christ, yes, into our life. Maybe you've heard that many, many times. But what we are receiving as well is the indwelling of his very being and the power that raised him from the dead that can raise you and I from these dead mortal bodies that constantly don't make sense and, and don't um, do the right thing and struggle and suffer, that he could give us a new life. It's often been called the here and now, uh, the here and now, but not yet. So we're here and now with Christ. He's living and dwelling within us. He's growing us, raising us up into that new life. That which he's already uh, placed in within us, that we would one day be with him, that we would be uh, sealed by him in heaven, that one day we will be there. But today we're working towards that with the help of the Paracletus, the one who has the same power that raised him from the dead and can raise you and I. You know, I recently had a, a few kids come to me and talk to me about situations in their life. And they're horrid. They're, they're situations that suck. You know, parents leaving, uh, breaking up, marriages, you know, splitting in ways that are really bad. And leaves chaos and carnage with the kids, right? And I'm trying to encourage these kids and I'm trying to, you know, think about, man, what do they need? You know, I'm sitting with them and I'm like, man, do they need a pat on the back? Do they need a hug? Do they need, you know, a good meal? Um, a friend, obviously. But in addition to all of that, mostly they need to know who can help them become a new creation that they've been called to be. They need to know that the way and patterns that they've seen in life, that there's a new way and that they actually could tap into that strength to be that person. You see, hope in my life, I've needed it a lot. And I've looked to people or circumstances as, do I have the resource needed in this moment to overcome this this trial this this struggle and oftentimes the answer i thought was no but you know in looking back on life i see that the lord was there the whole time and that it's usually in hindsight that we see that god navigated our way through that that struggle or whatever we were dealing with and that's hope when you recognize that the lord has given you the gift of his presence and power to be with you, to not be alone, but to have someone go with you through this struggle and be there at every moment. He's there. But not just that he's there, but that he has the power to overcome what you're going through. That's what makes a difference. That's good news. That's a gospel. And that's what being in Christ means. That we all have this spirit dwelling within us. That we all have the ability to, to have the power that raised Jesus from the dead. I hope that encouraged you today. Um, next week, we're going to be covering another section of uh, this element of what does it mean to thrive in Christ. I hope you guys have a great week. Love you, and I'll be praying for you. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the comments, and I'll do my best to get back to you and answer your questions or pray for you if you have needs as well. Love you guys. See you soon.